My name is Jerry Gill, and today is November 6, uh, 2008. I'm visiting with Dr. Patrick Morgan in his home in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Uh, this interview is for the O State Storage Project and the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Uh, Dr. Morgan, thank you for taking time to visit with us today. You're quite welcome. Uh, could, could we start with maybe a little bit tell us your, your pre OSU story, a little bit about uh, maybe where you grew up, a little bit about your career before you got to Oklahoma State University? Sure. I was uh, born and raised in Florida until I was uh, about 18 years old and then went off to school to first to Dartmouth and then back to Florida State mm -hmm. and then to the University of Georgia where I received the DVM degree. Mm -hmm. um, shortly after that I worked for USDA for four years then uh, received a Master of Public Health degree from Tulane University went into the Army for two years, went back to Tulane, and was a graduate student for the Doctor of Public Health mm -hmm. degree, mm -hmm. and then joined the faculty and administration there for about seven years. Mm -hmm. From there, uh, I came to Oklahoma in 1972. Mm -hmm. A man that I had worked with in El Salvador um, became Commissioner of Health here in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and he asked me if I would like to come and work with him here. I wasn't unhappy uh, where I was, but uh, Barbara and I sat down together and mm -hmm. put together some uh, conditions that, frankly, I didn't think would ever be met. And uh, a month went by and I didn't hear anything, and two months went by, and we both said, well, that's the end of that. And mm -hmm. Third month came, and he said, it's all worked out. When you, can you start? So I came here primarily with an appointment with the State Health Department but also had paying part-time faculty appointments at OSU, mm -hmm. uh, School of Veterinary Medicine, and at the OU uh, College of Public Health. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your responsibilities here, Dr. Moore. You were epidemiologist, I think, as well, and worked with, with human and, and animal health care. What were some of your responsibilities? That's correct. Uh, so what, what were some of your primary responsibilities? What would you, your typical job responsibilities include? When I was with the State Health Department, uh, I made three changes rather rapidly. At first, I was their so-called uh, public health veterinarian, and the department had, had no, never had a DVM mm -hmm. on their staff before. Mm -hmm. So anything that uh, came up involving an animal, particularly if it was mm -hmm. uh, touchy or gory or mm -hmm. uh, politically sensitive in any way, <laughs> It got funneled to me, and then later I became the state epidemiologist, and as far as just fun is concerned, that was the most fun I've ever had in a, in a job, although I've, uh, except for my Army experiences, uh, I've enjoyed most of the things I've done. Mm -hmm. Well, that, uh, you know, your career path was a little bit different probably than, than many veterinarians. Uh, Very atypical, mm -hmm. but I think it's an indication of the many things that are open to DVM. Mm -hmm. and, and more mm -hmm. every day. Uh, mm -hmm. Today, DVMs are uh, assigned positions that uh, they would not have been considered for mm -hmm. even 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. well, what did, did being a bit different, being in public health as much as you were in, in your human health, did it help prepare you for some of your administrative responsibilities and your leadership roles later in your career? Oh, absolutely. Uh, at one time with the State Health Department, uh, I was deputy commissioner for what they called personal health services. Mm -hmm. The department essentially had people things and thing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the people things were ultimately my responsibility. Mm -hmm. I had to request, uh, justify, and then manage uh, an annual budget of more than $50 million a year. You mentioned, you indicated earlier that you were visiting professor at Oklahoma State during this yes. period. What, what courses were you teaching? Uh, actually, two. Uh, one was in food safety, and the other was in uh, general epidemiology, mm -hmm. uh, zoonosis, uh, prevention, and control. Mm -hmm. What, uh, of course, I give you some time at Oklahoma State University, but could you share a little bit about what the circumstances that led you to the deanship position here at Oklahoma State University? I think so. Uh, as I said, from the day I came, I had part-time teaching assignments uh, in mm -hmm. both the College of Public Health mm -hmm. in Oklahoma City and here with the vet school. 
But I got to know uh, Bill Brock, and I'd come up, uh, first it started out to be two days a week, but I'd come and, and talk for two hours and go, and finally, well, they arranged it so I could come one day a week and uh, have two two-hour sessions mm -hmm. and not have to travel back and forth two mm -hmm. days. And in the course of that, I got to know Dean Brock uh, quite well. Mm -hmm. We visited a lot about the uh, both the commonality and the difference in administrative problems mm -hmm. in a state agency located in the capital to, and in academia. And just before he finally said, I've been interim dean for seven years now and enough is enough and I'm not going to do this anymore. Uh, he stopped me one day and said he wanted to talk with me and ask if I would be interested in the position and would I mind if he submitted my name. Mm -hmm. And I said no. A uh, couple of reasons. Uh, one is it's, it's not the same as it was, but at the time I was with the State Health Department I had gone as far as I could go. Mm -hmm. uh, by law, the Commissioner of Health had to be a physician. Mm -hmm. Now that has since changed, but at that time, I was mm -hmm. at my plateau. Right. And I'd always wanted to be in a position where uh, I achieved what I wanted to or failed mm -hmm. on my own mm -hmm. decisions and actions. Right. And since OSU vet school really is unique uh, to a lot of things because uh, we're a line item in a state university budget. Uh, the state regents appropriate money directly to uh, the veterinary school mm -hmm. and so it's not as if it goes to the general university and then it's parceled out. Right. What, uh, of course you probably, what was your sort of uh, your thoughts, I mean what, what did you know about Oklahoma State University uh, College of Veterinary Medicine at that time when you uh, said you'd consider being, uh, you know, the deanship position. What, what did you know going in about about the school? What were your perceptions? My first perception, I think, that I noticed when uh, first time I visited the the campus here, was that uh, they did not have an animal disease diagnostic laboratory, mm -hmm. and I was astounded <laughs> that a state such as Oklahoma, that has a very large uh, animal industry mm -hmm. for several species, uh, didn't have. The university through, or the college, through its departments of microbiology and pathology, did what they could, but that wasn't their primary mission. Mm -hmm. So it was, I was glad to see a uh, diagnostic laboratory be established, and you probably will remember initially it was in the Department of Agriculture, and mm -hmm. that was okay. the way that, mm -hmm. frankly, it was a political maneuver to bypass the state regions. So the money was, uh, you know how that goes, I don't I do. have to say anymore. <laughs> and then later it was transferred to the college, so now it is an official part of the college. Well, Dr. Moore, what do, you, what do you remember about the interview process? Can you share a little bit, can you go back a few years and recall the interview process and tell us a little bit about that? Uh, when I interviewed with the Regents? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, I'll just let that go. Uh, actually, we went to the uh, hotel there at Will, Ro Will Rogers Airport. No, Oklahoma City Airport. Mm -hmm. And the regents had flown in there from different places around the state. And I guess the uh, not to say anything negative about the others, but the most uh, charismatic and dynamic uh, fellow in the room was a, a huge man named John Montgomery, yeah. a veterinarian who spent many years in Poto. Yeah. And uh, not only was he my ultimate boss as the chairman of the Board of Regents uh, twice while I was here, yeah. uh, but he also became a very close friend. Yeah. And a practicing veterinarian. And a practicing veterinarian. Yeah. Uh, the others were, uh, uh, there was a newspaper man, a fellow who was a large uh, sheep producer, somebody from uh, the beef cattle industry, mm -hmm. and frankly I don't remember much, but I do remember that. And uh, 
I thought it went well. Uh, they were very direct, didn't beat around the bush, and made it clear to me that the primary problem I would be facing and they expected to see solved should I be offered the job and take it was well, a matter of uh, accreditation for the college. Uh, it's not known, it makes one wonder really what accreditation means in this instance because OSU for a long, long time has been producing uh, national and world-renowned graduates. Mm. But at that point in time, they had never, ever mm. had full academic accreditation. Can, can you explain just a little bit of the, the American Veterinary Medicine, uh, Medicine Association accreditation? Yes. Uh, mm. The veterinary profession is the, their professional organization, the AVMA, mm -hmm. Uh, is in fact a professional union that mm -hmm. it tries to protect and enhance the benefits of the members of the profession mm -hmm. and I think that's well and good however I have had questions in my mind a long time that a profession would regulate the academic institutions that produced that particular clinical mm -hmm. person uh, physicians don't do it dentists don't do it I don't think any of the other health professions do. But nevertheless, that's the way it was, and that's the way it still is. So we had to work within that framework. Mm -hmm. If I could give you a little background here before mm -hmm. I got involved directly, but I knew about it, uh, when the, there's a, what they call a council on education mm -hmm. in the AVMA hierarchy. Uh, these are not staff people. There is a senior staff person, but they're elected by the delegates to the AVMA. And they had come to OSU, had a site visit, uh, made the decision that the, the college was on, quote, confidential probation. Now, when uh, a minimum of 50 people know something, it's not gonna be confidential for very long. <laughs> and of course it wasn't. Uh, it, it hit the newspapers and there was a big Big splash, uh, oh, uh, we're gonna close the college, or will I be able to get a license in another state, and all those things. Um, the group went down to visit uh, Dr. E.T. Dunlap, who was uh, chairman of the State Regents for Higher Education, mm -hmm. and essentially the number one person in education in the state, and uh, a very uh, memorable person, in my mind anyway, mm -hmm. and, the first thing, uh, I was told this by one of the men that were there, and I have no reason to disbelieve him, but he said the first thing uh, E.T. did was make them wait 20 minutes past their appointed time. And then they came in, and he already knew they, he'd received a letter about this confidential probation, et cetera. And he said, before we get too involved in this, let me tell you that should you attempt to continue this probation or make any other serious charges about the university, I'll have a federal injunction against you before you can get back to Schaumburg, Illinois. Now, let's talk. <laughs> and we went from there. But nevertheless, they, our primary problem was lack of facilities. We did not have a teaching hospital in any sense of the word mm -hmm. that would suffice. Mm -hmm. I think the one we have here is quite nice. Uh, it's modest by national standards. Mm -hmm. um, I, as an alumnus of the University of Georgia, I recently received notice that they are building a new teaching hospital at a, an estimated cost of $50 million. In, in today's dollars. Now by the time it gets built, mm -hmm. who knows what that will actually be. So that's a big item, but mm -hmm. we have a teaching hospital now. It's mm -hmm. a good one. There constantly needs, uh, you know, maintenance and uh, new equipment mm -hmm. and things like that, but we're in good shape there. You, you mentioned, uh, sort of leading into it was kind of my next question, was when you got here, the challenges you know, that, that you faced, uh, were there some other things, uh, you know, when you assume the deanship position, and uh, and I'll follow that up here in a minute with your vision where you wanted to maybe take the college. But first of all, 
uh, your focus on what were, what were your challenges? Uh, accreditation was obviously one of them. Well, accreditation uh, uh, superseded anything else, but there were subsets that had to be achieved mm -hmm. before that could be achieved. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I, some of the things I found, and Bill Brock was very good in briefing me on what I could expect, uh, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the warts as well as the halos. Uh, mm -hmm. And he was very direct and told me some things I would be facing. And that's good. Uh, mm -hmm. you, it's, you don't want to discover those things uh, after the fact. No surprise. But as, as an example, uh, no professor in the College of Veterinary Medicine had ever been denied tenure. Mm. Remarkable. Ever. If they stayed here long enough, they got tenure. Mm -hmm. And that bothered me because you you deal with hundreds of people over time. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just a certainty that you're going to meet some people mm -hmm. that you don't want to make a lifetime commitment to. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's safe to say that in a lot of quarters, I was not a popular dean. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the job I had been given. My job was to get the college improved, to recruit the kind of faculty we needed uh, as much as possible, uh, uh, encourage the others to find someplace else to go. And with that, we took off uh, recruiting. Barbara and I were still living in, in Edmond. And at one time, we entertained uh, prospective faculty or administrators 14 nights in a row. And at that time, the Ancestor and the Holiday Inn and the Student Union were the only three places that you could take people to dinner. Mm. So we got to know the people at uh, uh, the Ancestor very well. <laughs> the, as I say, the other big problems, uh, you, you get down to money. Uh, the, the school simply was not funded well enough to hire the kinds of people we needed uh, to keep up the repairs and do the sort of things we needed to do. And Dean Brock told me that he felt, and I felt, that the relationship between the college and the faculty uh, was not as good as it could be with the alumni and with the practicing veterinarians mm -hmm. in the state. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be true, and that was one of the primary things that that I tried to work on. So I think it's safe to say that when you you set goals for yourself, uh, the closer you get to achieving them, the harder the next increment is. If you get to 70%, it's a lot harder to get to 80 than it was to get from 60 to 70. Mm -hmm. And that prevailed, and I, uh, that was expected and not, uh, not at all surprised. Mm -hmm. Having come from a university, Tulane Medical Center, that was strictly private, was totally dependent on uh, contributions, endowed funds, and tuition for their total income. I was accustomed to having to hustle out-of-state money, mm. or out-of-campus money, if mm. you will. And the another surprise to me was that the College of Veterinary Medicine had never entered a private grant application with any foundation, mm. ever. Mm -hmm. And um, with a lot of help from a number of people, uh, Bob Wood, uh, uh, Louis Stratton, of course, uh, Don Holmes, the people in the business office, Marilyn Wilson, Dorothy Scarborough, we put together an application to the Sarkis Foundation and were awarded $195,000. Mm -hmm. So that was a start, mm -hmm. and that has perpetuated itself, as you know, mm -hmm. and to mm -hmm. a lot what of... What about private fundraising, seeing the individuals? Have you done any of that in the college? Uh, yes, we, we started out that uh, in an attempt to get a better relationship with the alumni mm -hmm. about the one place where people from all over, not just in the state, but mm -hmm. graduates who were practicing in Boston or California or wherever, mm -hmm. would uh, congregate 
was uh, at the annual ABMA convention. Mm -hmm. The first convention that we had after uh, I came here was in Dallas. And I had talked to other people and they had said that these alumni gatherings at the ABMA had previously been a, a peanuts and uh, pretzels and a cash bar uh, and soft drinks. And I decided that that would be a good test to see what we could do. And uh, at the time, received a good bit of criticism for the amount of money that we spent on that mm. gathering. Uh, it was nice. It was very nice. Mm. Uh, we had a beautiful ice sculpture of uh, Pegasus, the mm. horse, and mm. whatever on the table, and uh, the best hors d'oeuvres the, the hotel could prepare. And I had several people uh, come up and uh, say negative things about wasting money on that. Mm. But as I had thought and predicted, uh, I had checks or money in my pocket that would pay for the thing uh, almost twice over before I left the room. Mm. So, and the people were, they were proud. They were going around to the other mm -hmm. uh, gathering and saying, hey, you want to see a, how school does it right? Come on over to... Come over to our place and, and let us show you. Mm -hmm. So I feel that um, if you're going to ask people to commit themselves, you need to commit something to them. Mm -hmm. Malcolm, what was your uh, uh, overworked word? What was your vision for where you wanted the college to go? And, and could you share maybe additionally some specific goals that you had in mind for the college? I wrote these down about 28 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure how I can remember them except in general terms, but uh, I did feel that uh, our research efforts were not mm. what they should be, mm. and that again goes back to funding. I felt that uh, the graduate education mm. was not what it should be, mm. and up until I guess it was 79 or 80, uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine had never received direct funding for graduate education. The formula was based mm -hmm. entirely on the number of DVMs produced. And indirectly, we had to beg money or, or borrow people from uh, the College of Agriculture and the College of Arts and Sciences to teach particular courses. Mm -hmm. But with Vice President uh, James Boggs' uh, assistance, that changed. And we began to get a direct allocation mm -hmm. uh, for graduate education and began to have more interns and residents in the clinical specialties. And those didn't come overnight, but they progressed well. Mm. And uh, I was happy with the, th the way things were going. So one of your goals then was graduate education and research yes. and, other, and a couple others you might have had? Well, it, it was uh, then and it still would be the, the reason that the college exists is to produce well-qualified DVMs. That's, that's number one. It has been, it should be. Uh, in recent years throughout the country, there's been an emphasis on research to the part where in some universities, I think the DVM program is second or perhaps third mm -hmm. priority. And I hope we never teach shift different. that way. Mm -hmm. We should have a strong, good research program, but not at the expense of the clinical degree program. What um, I understand, you were instrumental in helping, uh, you know, fund the uh, David L. Warren uh, Veterinary uh, Medical Teaching Hospital and helping ensure its uh, its completion. I understand it's already sort of in transition or beginning when you got there. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the, your the process that uh, for getting uh, final approval and funding? Yes, the, the idea for uh, a teaching hospital, which was a primary goal at that time, had been uh, considered a year or so before I ever came up here. Mm. In fact, then Senator Gene Stipe uh, submitted a bill uh, requesting that, but it did not pass. So uh, the idea was approved in principle but there wasn't any money. Mm -hmm. yeah. The problem there, uh, 
as you know in Oklahoma, we can't go into deficit spending. If we've got something that's, say, going to cost $9 million, which was the estimate at that time for the teaching hospital, uh, if you get $3 million this year, you can't write a contract for $9 million. You can only write a contract for three. Mm -hmm. So you stand the risk if you get three this year, three next year, and then three, of having three primary contractors. Mm -hmm. And I could see that as, a, as an absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, so we took the position that we were going to wait until we had all of the money before we went out to contract for bid. Mm -hmm. And David Boren was then governor. Mm -hmm. He had uh, been governor, uh, I think that was his last year in office. Mm -hmm. And he came in, you may remember, Jerry, on a program of uh, budget accountability, uh, no new construction, state construction, until all of the needed repairs uh, were done. And uh, he made one exception, and that exception was the teaching hospital. Mm -hmm. that, was the f that was the first major building that had been built on this campus in the previous 10 years. And uh, along with President Boger, uh, then Senator Bob Murphy, Dick Poole, I was in the governor's office when he said, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but before I leave office, I will somehow get the remaining $3 million you need earmarked for the college. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he did. There have been allegations that this was a quid pro quo deal that uh, if he, uh, you've probably heard those rumors. Uh, it, was, it was my next question. <laughs> the, uh, uh, if, if I get the money for you, will you name the hospital after right. me? Yes, and absolutely. that, I can assure you, did not happen. Mm. However, the regents, uh, in appreciation for what he did, uh, going against initially what he said his uh, commitment was, was going to be because he saw it as a distinct need, uh, the regents decided to name it the Boren Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital. Uh, there was a lot of yowing back and forth. Uh, as you probably will remember, Dan Draper was Speaker of the House then, and Senator Bob Murphy was Chairman of the Higher Education Appropriations Committee for the Senate. And they were not friendly with David Boren. In fact, both of them boycotted the dedication ceremony. Uh, they, they called me personally and said, we're not mad at you, we're not mad at the school, we just don't, uh, we don't agree with a lot of the things uh, Governor Boren has done, so uh, you won't see us there. But the, the night before the dedication ceremonies, the name Boren was not on the building. Mm. This is not known to many people. Those, a lot of them that know it are deceased or have moved on. Yeah. But uh, I received a direct uh, order, if you will, for the then chairman of the Board of Regents that it was uh, a mandate that we get the letters on the building before the ceremony. Sure. And they were put on there <laughs> about 2.30, as I recall. They'd been ordered, but they were still in the box. So that was an interesting time. Mm -hmm. It really was. Yeah, I was going to laugh. Of course, now it's, it's uh, you know, President David Bourne, you know. Uh, exactly. And, there was uh, alumni uh, disenchantment with that and follow, as a follow-up a few years later. And now the younger faculty, they have, no, they have no reason to know what transpired. And I still say that uh, even beyond that, mm -hmm. Uh, David Bourne has been a friend of that college, mm -hmm. so. And that was that was uh, from your our conversation here. That was a decision of, of our the OSU Board of Regents. Yes, mm -hmm. I know it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then there were some of them that said, "Well, you know, of course he appointed them to the board too." We had a lot of interesting sidelines on that. Let, let's move on to another. But it me, uh, it did clarify one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'd ever, I thought I already knew it, but I was told, remember, in your position. You may report to other people, but ultimately you're responsible to the Board of Regents, mm -hmm. and this is what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have any argument with it. I was, I wanted to see it done, but yeah, nevertheless, the, the President, uh, it wasn't a debatable issue with mm -hmm. me. President Boger have a position on that that you know of? He never stated one to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what, uh, 
you know, kind of changed the direction on that. And I know this was uh, getting the teaching uh, veterinary, uh, you know, medical teaching hospital was quite a, it was a long time dream of the college. Why, why was this so important to the college? The, the, there were two, uh, one direct and one indirect. The direct one was that we had facilities then that could provide the kinds of services that the animal owners, uh, both commercial and pets, mm -hmm. should have had and could only have if you have the proper facilities and, uh, and equipment. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, without those sorts of facilities, regardless of what else we did, we would not have received full academic accreditation. So it was a twofold thing. It was something uh, that should have been done whether the accreditation was a, a problem or not. Uh, but the two went hand in hand to me. And I'd like to say here that anyone that has ever uh, been directly involved in building a 3,000, 3,500 square foot home can multiply that to building a 143,000 net square feet building. And let me tell you, it's, it was a real learning experience for me. Uh, uh, we were very fortunate to uh, have available a man uh, who had been a working partner in a construction firm before he went to veterinary school, mm -hmm. and uh, Bob Wood. And he ran the interference uh, with the contractors, with the architects, with our university architects. Uh, I don't know how much time you have for war stories, but I'll just tell you too. Uh, before the building was started, uh, people from the faculty uh, went around to different schools that had recently built uh, teaching hospitals to find out what, if they had it to do over again, they would do or would not do. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they found out readily was there are very few architects and engineers that have ever built a large animal hospital. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a, a big hospital, not one just for large animals. Mm -hmm. And they try to use human codes, those that would be used in uh, mm -hmm. human hospitals. Mm -hmm. uh, a hundred pounds of animal feces is different from a hundred pounds of human feces. And you need to have your drains much, much bigger. Mm -hmm. And we knew that. And we actually had those modifications put on the drawings. They were modified. A change order that even though we had said before it was approved, you need to make these changes, uh, they were ignored. Dr. Wood came in my office one day. He said, there are 40 Delisi cement trucks out there ready to pour the foundation. And the largest drain they have is four inches and most of them are two. What are we gonna do? And I said, send them home because there's no point in pouring it and six months from now having to tear it up, which is what had happened at Texas A&M about three years before that. And that little hoorah cost us $40,000. Uh, then you may have noticed on the teaching hospital, there are large slabs of reinforced uh, concrete marble uh, rock covered that they just pick up and put into place. The tolerances on those were uh, plus or minus an inch and a half thickness. And if you could, if you stood at one end of it and looked down, you, you could see or I thought I could see that uh, they weren't within those constraints. Mm -hmm. So the construction foreman, I, I talked with him, and uh, he said, oh, so that's, a, that's an optical illusion. So you know how you look at a railroad track and it, it comes together down in the distance? That's, that's the same sort of thing. And he said, besides that, uh, there's no way we could measure it without drilling holes in it. Well, Bob would poke me, and uh, so we just left it to that, and he walked away. He says, he's lying to you, and he knows it. Uh, they do that with x-rays, and he says, I'll get you the names of two firms that do it. And so the next day I went back and saw him, and I said, you can get the x-rays done 
at either one of these two businesses, and we're not going to pay for this until we're sure you're within tolerance. So they had to remove one or two of the panels, but not the whole thing. But once they knew it was going to be checked, they paid more attention to what they were doing. And there were some other things that were really funny in, in, in <laughs> retrospect, but uh, it was something every day. It was a, you got to know the architects and the construction you, very well. You, you? Uh, like a duck, I woke up in a new world every day. <laughs> oh, gosh. What, uh, uh, you know, sort of getting that done, the, the third part kind of mind to ask you, I guess that was important, the clinical training of students as well, wasn't it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We just did not have the the appropriate facilities to mm -hmm. do some of the things we needed to do. Mm -hmm. And just by having good, dedicated uh, teachers, uh, Lester Johnson is a key mm -hmm. example in uh, equine medicine. Uh, we had several in uh, the others, and Ralph Buckter and Small Animal, mm -hmm. and I could name many more. Mm -hmm. But it was through their dedication and willingness to work uh, 60, 70 hour weeks uh, many times and not expect extra compensation mm -hmm. uh, because they believed in what they were doing. You, you touched on something that I, that when I visit with people about the college, that there's that sense of, of uh, commitment and passion that the faculty have. And, and oh, she's always, the College of Veterinary Medicine faculty has always been known as a good teaching faculty. You, you alluded to earlier that research is extremely important, but not at the expense of, of basic teaching of clinicians. And could you kind of expand on that a little bit and how you feel about uh, teaching and role at, at, at the college where you were there? Sure. Uh, I don't mind talking about that because it's it's one of the things I get on the soapbox about. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it's amazing what you can do with a group of students who want to learn and somebody that can speak and draw even some crude things on a chalkboard mm -hmm. uh, and show them and perhaps have some models uh, and then finally get to live animals to show them how to do different things. And through that mechanism, uh, we turn out a lot of good people. Now, Oklahoma State for a long time was known as a, quote, practitioner's school. Mm -hmm. That is, when the students walked out the end of graduation with their diplomas, they were ready to go to work. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have to go work with somebody for a year or two or three before they could do a decent job. As with anything, the more experience you have, the better you get at it. Mm -hmm. But there were other schools uh, which will remain nameless. Uh, some of their graduates told me that when they got their diploma, they had never performed one surgical procedure. They had to learn on their clients' animals after they got out of school. Mm -hmm. And I, th I frankly think that's unethical. Mm -hmm. uh, so these people, before they work on your animal, before they work on my animal, I want them to have had some experience. Mm -hmm. And that's getting harder and harder to do uh, because of some people's belief that uh, a dog or a cat or a sheep, uh, their life is just as important as a human. And I simply don't believe that, and I think a lot of people don't believe that. Uh, we're all committed to treating animals humanely, but uh, animals are subservient to people, in my opinion, and there are those that would argue me to, to their death on that point, but that's the way I feel, and if we are ever forced to get away from using teaching animals, uh, we'll be in trouble. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, earlier uh, Dr. Lester Johnson and some others. Could, could you maybe uh, comment on some of the, the teachers that you thought you know, were highly respected and did a great job there during your time and before and after also? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. And one of the things I would want to get into this is that for whatever reasons, we in academia tend to take people who are good teachers and put them in administrative roles for which they're not uh, really qualified, they don't, uh, they don't really want it, but that's the only way they're going to get promoted or get a, a salary increase. Peter Principal in action. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so I would say not just here but at, at Kansas State, uh, 
Fane Oberst uh, was known as an excellent classroom teacher, mm -hmm. and I think he did. I think he did a good job there, and I think he get a, did a good job here. Uh, I, I could name many uh, other than than Lester, uh, uh, Bob Smith, who's still around and mm -hmm. as a consultant in the beef cattle industry, was very good at herd health management and and working with students and showing them what to do. Uh, Tom Munnin for many years was an excellent equine surgeon. Eventually he's, his eyesight uh, forced him uh, out of the active role, but he was there for a lot of years and he taught a lot of people. Uh, Dr. Lorne Evans, uh, you may remember Lorne, he was, uh, could have passed as a double for William Conrad and Jake and the Fat Man and Cannon and whatever. And he was a rough old boy, but he taught a lot of people a lot of radiology. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those are just a few of those that, mm -hmm. that I remember. Well, what about some of the curricular changes and, and clinical practice changes, you know, methodology when you were there as dean? Can you recall some things, some innovations that you put in place? Well, I wouldn't call them uh, my innovations, but there was a... a serious discussion as to allocation of resources uh, in, in various things. And uh, one of those, as I mentioned previously, I think, was graduate education and postgraduate clinical training in internships and residencies. And that happened. If there was one major thing that I think transpired, uh, the curriculum was adjusted to account for those things. As a specific example, uh, there had never been a course taught on laboratory animal medicine. Mm -hmm. And when we think about it, every prescription drug that you and I take or have taken during our lifetime was first tested on one species of animal mm -hmm. or more. Mm -hmm. And yet we weren't preparing our students even marginally to deal with these things. Mm -hmm. So uh, the convincing Don Holmes, who is an OSU alumnus, to leave the OU Health Science Center and come up here as Director of Laboratory Animal Medicine, uh, not only did he play a, a teaching role, but he also provided a service as the uh, University Laboratory Animal Veterinarian mm -hmm. to see that any research projects using animals uh, was managed properly. Mm -hmm. and. And according to law, sometimes the researchers uh, mean to do well, and for the most part do, but there may be some aspect of federal law, which essentially means if you take our federal dollars, you can play by our rules. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, Don was very good, and uh, when he saw a deviation from that, pointing out that if they were going to continue to get federal funds, they had to make these modifications, and people did. There were very few that uh, got angry about it. They just thought they were doing okay and didn't didn't know better. And I might say that Don, uh, while he was here, wrote a textbook. And there were at that time, you know, you'd have a book on subhuman primates, you'd have a book on rats and mice, you'd have a book on rabbits, but there wasn't a comprehensive text that at least hit the high points of most of the lab animal species. And Don wrote that and published it, and it's now used around the country. Any other curricular changes or clinical practice changes you would call occurred during your tenure? The <coughs> initiation of uh, preceptorships or externships or whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. where our students would uh, spend a certain period of time before they graduated working with a private practitioner. Mm -hmm. Uh, hopefully those that wanted to go into cattle practice would work with a cattle practitioner. Those that wanted some other area would work there. And once again here, Lester Johnson was the person who was so well respected around the state that he could visit these practices to make sure that the students weren't picking up bad habits. Mm -hmm. uh, those were minimal, but uh, when we did discover that in rare instances, then we just didn't continue with that individual. But as again, that was a rare exception. But it did take into things uh, 
time management. Mm -hmm. uh, those of us that spend our time mostly in academia, our clocks are, are, are slowed down compared to what the private practitioner mm -hmm. does. If we, for example, uh, take 45 minutes or an hour to do a simple uh, spay on a cat and the practitioner is accustomed to doing a good job skin to skin and no more than 15 minutes, uh, the perspective of the, of the student changes. Mm -hmm. Not only do they have to do it well, but they have to do it well within a prescribed period of time. So I think that was a major change. Well, you, you kind of brings the interesting point, uh, uh, Dr. Morgan, about uh, the relationship with practitioners, and that, that's always important to the college. Can you talk a little bit about the relationships and your, your time there with practitioners, with alumni of the college, some of the things that you did to invested in to strengthen those relationships? Well, some of the things that uh, that evolved were, well, in fact, most of them were, were ideas that came from other people. Uh, I, I simply signed my name and pulled the trigger, but mm -hmm. they weren't uh, they weren't necessarily my ideas. Mm -hmm. But having spent uh, from 72 to 77 with the state health department, I already knew a lot of practitioners scattered around the state mm -hmm. uh, because of my interactions with them mm -hmm. um, with human health related problems. Uh, brucellosis, uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, rabies of course, mm -hmm. At one time, Oklahoma was uh, one of the, uh, this is not good. Mm -hmm. Being in the top three in numbers of cases of animal rabies is not good as opposed to BCS ratings. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of uh, things to do there. And I remember one episode, uh, one of the practitioners in Paul's Valley was convinced that uh, deer were aborting uh, their fetuses in his pasture and contaminating the uh, uh, his cattle. Mm. So I picked it up and brought it up here to school to get uh, people here to say, is this, it was early stage, is this a, a cow fetus or is this a deer fetus? Mm. And we had uh, two or three DVM PhDs there poking at it and looking at it. And a fourth year DVM student walked by and he says, what are you doing Dr. Moore? I said, oh, these fellows are going to try to tell me that uh, whether this is a, a calf fetus or a deer fetus. And he says, oh, that's a calf fetus, and just kept walking. And, of course, the professors around there were highly indignant and demanded to know how he could take a glance at it and make that determination. And his reply was, deer don't have long tails. So... Yeah, sometimes we're looking for minutia, and the obvious thing is right there in front of us, and and we miss it. But there, there are a lot of humorous things that have happened along the way. Did you did you have, engage any activities where you brought uh, practitioners, alumni back, and to strengthen those relationships? Oh yes, oh yes. We uh, once again the idea of pinching pennies to take care of your uh, alumni is counterproductive and. Uh, Bill Brock, bless his heart, had uh, left me enough money in the uh, unrestricted foundation accounts mm -hmm. that uh, we could do some things that we would not have been able to do. Mm -hmm. And soon, rather than an obligation, people began to look forward mm -hmm. to coming to uh, alumni affairs, receptions at conventions, mm -hmm. uh, continuing education programs here, homecoming, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It was. Uh, it was a pleasure, not, a, not an obligation. And as a result, uh, we got more and more referrals from those people when they uh, would send a case in. And we tried to inculcate in every new faculty that came on board. The older fellows here already understood that by older, I mean, <laughs> they weren't new graduates. Mm -hmm. they, they had some miles on them. Knew that when somebody sent you in a referral, if you don't get back to them and tell them what you did and why, and regardless of how bad you might think they had done in their initial treatment, you don't criticize them in front of a client. You may call them and say, hey, Joe, you, you really missed it here, but that's done private between. Mm -hmm. uh, and most of the time, that isn't the case. 
but there's a way to handle things like that and mm -hmm. and not why so we tried to inculcate those things and and for the most part I think did mm -hmm. so we began to get more and more referrals sort of back on it you mentioned the focus on students can you recall some things in terms of the student experience that y'all maybe uh, tweaked or changed a little bit to, to create academic excellence uh, you know better graduates more prepared practitioners One of the aspects of, of selecting students that I believe in, and a lot of people don't, is the person with the uh, 4.0 GPA may well not be uh, your best clinician, mm -hmm. frequently or not, mm -hmm. and may not be the best people person. Because regardless of how good a clinician you may be, if the animal owner doesn't like you, He's not going to keep bringing his animals to you unless he just has to. And very few have to go to any one place anymore. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a consideration. And in admissions, the, the practitioners, yeah, I'm generalizing, but when you've got, say, 1,500 people and... Uh, a hundred of them make a lot of noise on one particular point, uh, it's noticeable. And there was complaints that uh, we were only admitting students that could make good grades, not those that were interested in mm -hmm. uh, farm work or helping ranchers and farmers and, and whatever. And I believe that there should be a spectrum of people admitted, not just those with the highest. Mm -hmm. They've got to be qualified or they're not gonna get through the program. But whether a person, for example, has a 3.2 GPA or a 3.6 GPA, I think there are other things involved in considering that person. Uh, and consequently, uh, we appointed a number of private practitioners mm -hmm. to the admissions committee. And when the applicants came for interviews, they would be paired off, a practitioner with a faculty member. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, the student didn't get just one side of the picture during their interview, and also each student was interviewed twice. So you had four people in the, uh, in the process uh, to level out any bias anybody might have, mm -hmm. any one person. And I think it worked well. You had practitioners and professors and yes. sometimes both interviewing. Or anything in the students' uh, process going through over the, you know, the four-year, three-year, four-year programs uh, that you implemented? Mm. Well, I guess one thing that uh, that I initiated that I'm proud of is uh, the first minority, that is, black minority, mm student fellowship uh, for the college, I don't know about the main campus, mm -hmm. was started in the College of Veterinary Medicine in honor of Dr. John Montgomery. Mm -hmm. And it's called the John W. Montgomery uh, Scholarship Fund. Mm -hmm. And the, it was set up as, a, as an endowment. And I might say here that one of the things that uh, and I'm, I'm going to say I because I did here, that I emphasized and promoted uh, was to use mon's, funds in a way where you had an endowment. You just didn't get $100,000 and spend $100,000. Mm -hmm. You invested that $100,000 and spent your interest mm -hmm. off of what <coughs> came in there. And in that way, this particular starting out small scholarship has grown and grown and grown. Mm -hmm. uh, so... There's something I will get to later on about things I initiated, but you may ask me about it, so I'll I'll wait. If you don't, I'll bring it up. Yeah. Okay. What uh, uh, the uh, there was an enhanced emphasis on research that you mentioned you earlier in our conversation in the college. Uh, what what were some of the areas of research that uh, that maybe uh, discoveries uh, procedures? That, uh, that developed in your, your time there in research areas? Well, two that come to mind uh, was uh, research in tick-borne diseases. Uh, 
uh, primarily anaplasmosis in cattle, mm -hmm. uh, and also, of course, uh, human diseases. Uh, and uh, then in uh, respiratory disease in cattle, uh, what they call shipping fever, mm -hmm. and stress-related problems in, in other animals when they're transported from the farms or the ranches to slaughter or to feedlot or from feedlot to slaughter. Uh, stress will precipitate a lot of things that aren't evident mm -hmm. when they're simply on pasture or in pens and whatever. Uh, Oklahoma State did have a a patent on an anaplasmosis vaccine mm -hmm. uh, developed uh, largely uh, by Bell Brock and uh, mm -hmm. uh, Ginger Jones and others. Uh, J.K. Hare worked with the veterinary school even though he was in entomology uh, at the College of Agriculture. Mm -hmm. And subsequent to that, uh, Dr. Kathy Kosan has done extremely well in uh, tick-borne research. She mm -hmm. goes all over the world uh, uh, giving lectures, learning from her counterpoints, uh, parts in, uh, in Africa, in uh, Australia, in Israel, mm -hmm. wherever. Uh, and she, I don't remember the name of the chair, but she now has a uh, Regents Research Chair. I don't remember the name of the particular chair. So we're talking about uh, you know, several different uh, kind of expansion and developments within the uh, college. Uh, Dr. Morgan, you're there. What about in, in some of the areas of uh, administration and some of the things in finance and you know, some of the things we were talking about kind of off camera there for a minute? One of the things that was immediate uh, cause for concern to me uh, was the untimely death of Bill Brock shortly mm -hmm. uh, after I came here full time. And then uh, Ginger Jones, uh, who was essentially manager of all of the federal and uh, research funds, and uh, the business manager left to go to Mississippi State. Mm -hmm. That was starting about that time. Then I was fortunate enough to be able to hire Marilyn Wilson, who had a degree as an accounting, as an accountant, but uh, was working as a secretary. But the point is, uh, as they say, we learned about doing. So uh, it was a it was a learning experience for her and for me. Um, we made a trip to Washington to uh, visit Senator Bellman about some federal funding at one time. But the the major thing that I really enjoyed in the funding process was to have the right or be granted the the right to stand up before the state regents and tell people what good would happen if we received these funds and what bad would happen if we did not receive these funds. And with Marilyn there to answer any of the, uh, the fiscal related uh, properties uh, questions, uh, we fared very well in the percentage of, of increase in funds from one year to the other. In fact, I would say we were, we were always at least uh, in the top six or seven, and frequently the top two or three. In percentage of increase in your in revenue for in the college. percentage of increase of state appropriated funds. Right. Well, what do you attribute that, uh, Dr. Morgan? Did you the case you're making for it was it uh, good good times financial for the state or what was? Uh, both. Uh, the good financial times were just beginning, mm -hmm. but I think the primary thing was being able to communicate uh, both from the sociological scientific uh, part as well as the fiscal part uh, by Mrs. Wilson. In fact, it, uh, it, got to be, it got to be something I look forward to. Most mm -hmm. people dread uh, going to things like that, but we had some good people mm -hmm. that would, would prep me as to what was likely to come up and so and so and uh, through the first two of these we began to get to know the uh, assistant chancellor for finance and the assistant program for programs and and early on uh, I told them that I they'd asked me a couple of questions that we really didn't have time to complete in the formal setting mm -hmm. and I said well can I 
spend a little time with you guys here unofficially one day. We'll come down and talk to you. So we arranged to do that, and at that point in time, their, their idea of a DVM was what most of the public think of. They're a person that takes care of my animal when it gets sick. Mm. And we know from experience that approximately 30% of all DVM graduates spend the majority of their professional careers in something other than fee-for-service private practice. Mm. So I uh, made an appointment uh, with Dan Hobbs and uh, Ed, and blanked on that one, the two deputy uh, chancellors for the state. What started out to be a, a one-hour appointment ended up to more than three hours. Mm. Uh, they, the, the, the idea that uh, veterinarians were involved in the evolution of the drugs that they took for their high blood pressure mm. was something they never, never considered. Mm -hmm. And the other things that veterinarians were doing in the armed services, mm -hmm. in industry, and all sorts of things. And uh, I think opening of their minds to the various aspects of our profession did as much as anything to help us get the funding we needed. Reverend, what about uh, private fundraising and about grantsmanship? Uh, did these things uh, increase also in, in, during your tenure? Yes, they did. I, I think that uh, I mentioned the Sarkis Foundation mm -hmm. to you. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the first major uh, foundation award that uh, the college had ever received. Mm -hmm. and. At that time, one hundred ninety-five thousand dollars was a was a pretty nice uh, uh, gift, and it was strictly for uh, clinical equipment that we could not have afforded through state appropriations. For example, uh, we paid a company to develop a pneumatic table for working on large animals, bulls, big horses. Mm -hmm. Uh, it worked on a hoist just like it does for your car when you take it to the shop, except it would rotate vertical or horizontal. Mm -hmm. You sedate the animal, lead it up beside the table, strap it down, turn it horizontally, mm -hmm. and raise it at whatever level you want. Mm -hmm. On both sides of it, there were flaps that if you had a, a five-foot surgeon or a six-foot-six six surgeon, you could adjust it to their size. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the contact area stainless steel. So we developed something that at that time did not exist. Mm. And we were able to do that through the private money we got from Sarkis. Right. Did, did you have a, a development officer at that time, a you know, fundraising officer? We had one, mm -hmm. me. <laughs> did, did you make some calls? You bet. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> I like to make calls mm. face to face. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't mind, you know, calling somebody and say, hey, I want to We'll talk to you about this and see if you can help us out and you give me a, a time to uh, to come and it was interesting and uh, these people talk to one another mm -hmm. and sometimes I would get a call from people that uh, had never before uh, contributed to the college and those that I knew better uh, I would ask you're very generous and we appreciate it. Uh, why don't I have a record of your participating in these programs before? And the most common answer was nobody asked me. Mm -hmm. well, surely there's some good stories there. Hey, can, can, can you share some stories with us, some of your fundraising stories? Well, this is a minor thing, and, but it's a, it's a personal thing. Uh, you know, we tend to inherit whatever furniture and fixtures and whatever is uh, uh, is in the office mm -hmm. of the person that you replace. And uh, I think by the time I got in there, it was about fifth generation uh, mm -hmm. stuff in the dean's office. And Bill Brock, being the, the generous man that he was, uh, preferred to take what money he had and 
put it elsewhere that he thought was more important. But I was talking to an alumnus one day about uh, uh, providing some funds to the college, uh, specifically in scholarships in a given area. And he said, you know, I won't use his word, but he, <laughs> he, he says, uh, if you're going to ask people for money, you shouldn't do it in an office that, that looks this crummy. You need to you need to dress this up. And I said, well, uh, I tried to at one time with some foundation money, but uh, it got it got disapproved. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm going to send you a furniture catalog, and you pick out what you want to want to have here in the office, send it back to me, I will buy it and have it brought to your office and installed. And he did. So here's an instance where uh, an alumnus was a little ashamed of what uh, where his dean was uh, working and wanted to improve it. That's, great that's just a small great thing. But what, what, what was your biggest gift you recall getting from fundraising call? Mm. From an individual, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of, I won't say small, but modest contributions, mm -hmm. but they spread. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you could see it. You, you could see uh, uh, in an area, mm -hmm. let's say the southwestern part of the state, you get one or two veterinarians contributing, and they go to their local meetings and they talk, and the next thing you know, uh, you've got another one. Mm -hmm. One example I can think of is the uh, Stevens County uh, veterinarians, and I don't remember who, who put this together, but they set up an arrangement so that they did not charge for euthanizing any animal, but would tell the owner, if you want to make a con contribution, it will go into a scholarship fund for DVM students at OSU. And it's still in existence. Wow. And mm -hmm. over the past 25 years, uh, I, I couldn't put a figure on it, but I think that uh, that's just one example of, uh, of a small thing that over time has turned out to be quite generous. Can you recall any corporate gifts other than you got the Sarkis Foundation, but any other gifts that you got in terms of fundraising gifts? Uh, no, I can't, but I, uh, there's something different that I think worthwhile mentioning here, and that is a contract. Uh, along about the time, that in the mid-70s, the numbers of veterinary schools in the U.S. Uh, was less than 20, mm -hmm. and there were literally... Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of qualified students that uh, could not get admitted to a veterinary school mm -hmm. anywhere in the U.S. So a businessman by the name of Robert Ross, who had started a private medical school in the Caribbean mm -hmm. and had been uh, quite a success, decided that he would uh, start a veterinary school. Mm -hmm. And he contacted uh, three people the, you may have known Bill Thurman when he was provost of the Health Science Center. Uh, I had known Dr. Thurman at Tulane before he came here. Uh, we maintained our, our friendship. And when Bob Ross said he was going to start a veterinary school and asked him, uh, can you recommend somebody to advise me, uh, he gave Dr. Ross my name. Mm -hmm. Then the chief of staff of the Animal Medical Center in New York City is a very high profile person. Mm -hmm. And uh, that fellow and I had become friends in the Army and had maintained friendships mm -hmm. ever since. And so Bob Ross called him, asked him if he would be willing to advise him, mm -hmm. and did he know anybody that might be of assistance. And he gave him my name to Bob. Mm -hmm who called me and says, and these two people did not know one another. The two, <laughs> so he said, you may not know anything about veterinary medicine, but you know a lot of people. So, 
and there was a third man appointed uh, that had been president of the AVMA. Mm -hmm. And in our ultimate wisdom, since we knew more people were, more schools rather, were being all put on stream, uh, we told Bob Ross that we didn't think it would be financially viable to do that. And he said, gentlemen, I've forgotten more about money than you'll ever know. Don't worry about that. And he said, now I'm gonna build this school, whether you help me or not. I'd like for you to help me because I believe you know what you're doing. And we decided if he's gonna do it, we might as well advise him on uh, yeah. uh, how to do it right. The reaction to this was rather astounding to me. There was a great deal of negative uh, attitude uh, about it. You know, you're selling out to the enemy. Mm -hmm. These people are going to be our competitors, blah, 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 blah. Well, today there are 10 jobs for every graduate. So mm -hmm. anybody that wants to work mm -hmm. has, has got a job. But then after the, the school was started, wasn't doing well because no private school like that can afford a teaching hospital. Mm -hmm. Even a even nine million dollar one, they just can't do it. So Dr. Ross talked to me, said, what about uh, writing a contract that the students that you are willing to accept up to a certain number will send to OSU and they'll go through clinical rotations just like your students do. Whatever you require of OSU students, mm -hmm you require of, of these students. So I went, I talked to the university attorney mm -hmm. uh, and I talked to President Boger and I was concerned about somebody claiming conflict of interest mm -hmm. and uh, Charlie Drake uh, said, well, if anybody should be worried about that, it should be Bob Ross because you know how much he can pay and how much he will pay, which was true. <laughs> so we started a contract to take up to a certain number of students each year but we didn't have to take a student. If we didn't like their, their looks, we didn't have to take them. Mm -hmm. But that started out, and I'd have to check with Marilyn Wilson, but the amount of money that has brought into that college is in the millions. Mm -hmm. wow. So that was not a gift. Mm -hmm. It was a gift in a sense. Uh, I mean, the faculty earn it. They teach the students, but also they get the benefits of some extra travel, some equipment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. some other things that they would not have were it not for that mm -hmm. money. And that is now a sizable portion of the, the college's budget. Great, great. What, uh, what, what issues, you looking back, what issues did uh, Dr. Morgan, did you struggle with the most in your, in your time? You know, the, the one you, that I just mentioned was one of them. Uh, to my astonishment, the basic science faculty uh, scream bloody murder that I had not uh, conferred with them before going ahead with this contract. Mm -hmm. And my thinking was they're not going to have anything to do with these students, so mm -hmm. why should they care? I had talked to the clinical faculty, and many of them had some reservations. And my approach was, well, let's do it for a year, and if it doesn't work out, we mm -hmm. won't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And people who in my mind had other axes to grind, uh, as I told you before, uh, I was not too popular in some circles mm -hmm. because I did deny tenure to a couple of people fairly soon and I won't go into the reasons why, but there was full justification for it. And, and, and to, to the point where they set up a fake interview with a reporter from the Daily Oklahoman. Mm. Uh, I thought it was kind of funny that he wanted to talk to me about something. Mm. I thought he would want to talk to the Dean of Agriculture, but anyway, he did. But he didn't, and he brought in this investigative reporter, uh, Mike Hammer, I don't know if you ever heard of him or not. He was a rumor monger, and the first question was, just how much kickback have you taken from Bob Ross to initiate this thing? Well, that hit the front page of the Daily Oklahoman, and fortunately, one of these alumni that I told you about, I'd, I'd gotten to know, uh, was a good personal friend of the managing editor of the Daily Oklahoman. And he called me and he says, what's all this foolishness about? And I told him, he said, can you document that? I, 
He said, I said, absolutely. You know, I've got the, it's approved by the Board of Regents in advance, signed off on by the university attorney. Yeah, sure, I can do that. He said, well, what do you want to do? You want to, you want to get a new car? You want to uh, renovate your house? Or what do you want? I said, all I want is to stop. Because it's not true, and that was the end of it. It just no nothing was said anymore. But that was the extent to which uh, some people would do, because they didn't get their way. Uh, there's some people who have a philosophy that management of a university should be done by committee. Mm. I believe that committees should make recommendations, and the person responsible for the program makes the decision. Most of the time, you can and should take the recommendations. But when you know it's not correct, uh, if you don't do what you think is right, you're not earning your money. Mm. So that had alienated uh, a number of people. <clears throat> Pardon me, and it's no secret because it's it's published in uh, Eric uh, Williams' book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Five of the faculty went secretly, they thought, to the president to ask him to remove me from office. And in this campus, I knew they were there before they left, so uh, it, it wasn't a big surprise. And uh, it was it was distracting, uh, it was a negative effect. Uh, yeah. You know how it is, Any anything bad you see in the pe paper, people are tend to believe it uh, yeah. first. But nevertheless, uh, and one of these guys, he was due to retire in less than a year. Mm -hmm. So naturally there was fallout from this. And I was talking to him, I said, you got less than a year to retire. Mm -hmm. Why on earth would you get involved in something like this? And ultimately his answer was, because you never asked me to go to lunch. So what people will do and the reasons they'll do them, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think a part of this, what triggered it, was uh, the termination of a tenured full professor. Mm -hmm. And I had, uh, I'd been in Costa Rica and got in the night before, mm -hmm. late, and about eight o'clock, uh, President Bogart's secretary said, uh, the president wants you in his office in uh, no more than 15 minutes. And I said, I can't. I'll be there as soon as I can. We get, I walk in and here's the president, the vice president, both the university attorneys, the chief of university uh, security, and I don't have any idea while I'm there. Mm -hmm. Well, to cut to the chase, uh, one of our uh, faculty had been arrested uh, while I was gone and uh, it ultimately led to his termination uh, for, quote, moral turpitude, mm -hmm. end quote. My role was to, as dean was to recommend that an investigation be made to see if there was justification mm -hmm. to terminate this person. Mm -hmm. uh, as that went through its process, including uh, appeal to the University of Senate, uh, then to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, it was all upheld. Mm -hmm. It was all done appropriately. Mm -hmm. You may remember our little uh, yellow book, Appendix A, tells you how to do everything. Well, we, uh, we had to do that. That was a sad thing, but it was a necessary thing. Mm -hmm. and so that was probably the one most difficult thing that I had to do, because passions were high. Mm -hmm. And in the course of it, we took the position that we're not going to do anything to harm mm. anyone any more than we have to. Mm. You know, we're not going to drag family or friends or whatever into this. This is an individual situation. And it's, it's still been that way. That's, it's sealed. It should be that way. Mm. But that was tough. Mm. Well, see, if you, see, you step, when you stepped down as dean, you took a year of leaving and, 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 and taught in a sabbatical situation. You, you came back then and taught. In the faculty after that, did you? Yes. Uh, Barbara and I, in fact, went to St. Kitts in the uh, Leeward Islands of the Caribbean mm -hmm. 
and I taught for a year at the Ross Veterinary School that had been established there. Uh, about uh, three weeks after we got there, the dean got a telephone call that a job he'd been trying to get for the past five or ten years was open, and if he could be there within two weeks, it was his. So he promptly left, mm -hmm. and not wanting it, but uh, mm -hmm. there not being anybody else around to do it, I told uh, Bob Ross I would serve as interim dean for 90 days mm -hmm. until he got somebody else. Being the businessman that he was, getting two for one, uh, the new dean came in at day 89. <laughs> so uh, then we came back here, and uh, I was very gratified. The regents appointed me a regent service professor. And I stayed here with the exception of uh, about two and a half, almost three years under contract mm -hmm. to the state health department. Mm -hmm. You know, the Intergovernmental Personnel mm -hmm. Act mm -hmm. goes, I'm detailed there, but they pay the university, the university pays my salary. Mm -hmm. So other than that, uh, I came back here and attempted to teach uh, preventive medicine, public health courses mm -hmm. until 1995. I retired from the university in 1995. A pretty long history with the, with the college, twenty something years. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, looking back as you as you, as you look back, what uh, uh, what achievements and innovations in the college, uh, you know, uh, during your time there give you the most professional satisfaction and personal pride. On, on the big scale of of course achieving full accreditation for the first mm -hmm. time in the history of the college, it's it's got to be number one. At a different level, seeing students uh, and young faculty develop from shy, reclusive almost, uh, tongue-tied people when they get up in front of a group, to very polished, articulate people who are winning the Outstanding Teacher Award three years out of five and are others uh, being nationally, internationally recognized for their uh, for their achievements. Uh, one of the students, one of the few students that showed an active interest in public health while he was still a veterinary student, just gave the keynote speech at the fall conference here. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Barrett is now the director of the Plum Island uh, Laboratory Island that does all of the work on foreign animal diseases mm -hmm. and has a quarantine station uh, you may remember was uh, uh, mentioned in the uh, Hannibal Lecter book and referred to as Anthrax Island. Uh -huh. uh, and it is, the Anthrax is one of the many things mm -hmm. that they have on that place. So uh, Dr. Barrett is an uh, is example. Uh -huh. uh, not while I was here, but prior to my coming here, Dr. Leroy Coggins uh, developed the Coggins test for horses. It's used mm -hmm. worldwide for equine infectious anemia. Uh, there's another gentleman whose name I wish I could remember, but I don't. Received the Henry G. Bennett Award. Uh, he received later a PhD, but his basic science was here with the DVM. Mm -hmm. Then he got a PhD and ended up as Director of Molecular Research at the MD Anderson Cancer Hospital. Mm -hmm. So we have people going everywhere. Yeah, and Isaiah Fiddler. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. You're right, mm -hmm. Dr. Fiddler. I was on the stage when he got the award, but mm -hmm. uh, it's been some time ago. OSU Alumni Hall of Fame, which I remember from when yes. he inducted him several years ago. Very, what uh, sort of generalizing your, you know, your 20 years, you had a, a broad look, uh, Dr. Morgan, at, at the veterinary medicine profession and, and at the college here. Uh, what uh, what significant changes and developments have you seen at the college over, over you know, two decades or more? And how's it changed and how's it moved in what direction? It's changed in one sense in that uh, we went from a status of only taking Oklahoma residents, mm -hmm. which really didn't work because a lot of people would come here from other states and work for a year or two and establish residencies. Mm -hmm. So they weren't, their roots weren't in Oklahoma, mm -hmm. if you will. And once we got by that stipulation from the state legislature. You know, in theory, the legislature can't directly affect what you do, but uh, 
they can sure make you wish you had when Appropriations Day comes around. <laughs> so, but now we're taking uh, contract students from two or three different states, and they pay out-of-state tuition, which is essentially double what in-state tuition is. Uh, don't take many, but we do take a few. A small contract with New Jersey, a small contract with Delaware, and one other state, Arkansas, I think. In fact, many of our alumni are uh, from Arkansas or live in Arkansas now because for many years we had a large uh, contingent mm -hmm. of Arkansas students on another field uh, politically uh, in the past let me see I think in the past 12 years three of the AVMA presidents have been OSU graduates American Vendor Minister right. Association three in the last 12 years yeah Wow. Not much. It might be 13 or 14, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. certainly more than our share, if yes. you will, mm -hmm. in graduates. And uh, even though he's not a kind of state graduate, Dr. Sam Strom and Paul Huska is certainly an honorary Okie because he spent his entire professional career mm -hmm. here since he got out of veterinary school. Mm -hmm. That's great. Well, what, uh, how, how do you see, how's the, how's the, uh, uh, veterinary medicine profession changing in, and I want to have a follow-up question then here in a minute. I see two major changes. Uh, one is in the uh, gender ratio of mm. males and females. Of course, when I went to school, and uh, uh, in case you don't know, I graduated 50 years ago, so I just went to our, my 50th uh, graduation reunion, mm. which was quite a Mm. experience to see people that you literally had not seen or talked to in 50 years. Mm. But uh, from going to less than 1% female to 75% uh, commonly, mm -hmm. usually at least 60% mm. in all the schools mm. around mm -hmm. the country. Uh, and that, that changes uh, for lots of reasons. I, uh, some of them I think are good. Some of them uh, for the profession aren't good, but nevertheless, that's the way it is. The other big change is the evolution of large corporations owning multiple practices. There's a group called Banfield that was started in Banfield, uh, Oregon, and they now own something like uh, 560 hospitals scattered around the United States. And they are primarily preventive medicine, uh, I won't call it minor surgery, but not complicated surgery. They will do spays and neuters uh, and a few other things, of course, mm -hmm. sew up lacerations or wounds, but any major things, thoracic surgery, uh, abdominal surgery, they, they're, they just don't do that. Mm -hmm. But what they do is a high profit part of the practice. And they hire new graduates and essentially give them a year's uh, experience mm -hmm. at a reduced rate, the equivalent of a, an internship, I guess. But what it does provide is benefits. Mm -hmm. The sole private practitioner today, uh, unless they have a certain number of employees, is really hard pressed to get decent mm -hmm. uh, medical insurance. Mm -hmm. uh, the AVMA does a good job of what they can do, mm -hmm. but people, new graduates are looking more and more into uh, benefits, mm -hmm. be it medical, retirement, mm -hmm. whatever. And of course that, that helps people like Banfield. Another group is Veterinary Corporation of America. They've probably got about 350 hospitals uh, scattered around the country, several in Oklahoma. And what they usually do is take, uh, they buy an established practice and will pay the person they buy it from an agreed upon salary to stay there for a year or sometimes considerably longer in a transition period. But at that point, the veterinarian doesn't have to worry about hiring the kennel help uh, keeping the roof repaired, seeing that the grounds are up kept, uh, kept properly, and 
if you get 360 hospitals buying certain products, you get a much better price than if you have one hospital buying certain products. So, uh, is that, that, in your opinion, good or bad for the profession? Uh, let me put it this way. I think the mindset of the majority of the graduates today is different from what it was 50 years ago. Uh, we never have given much training in business management. We try now, but when I went through school, there was literally nothing. Mm -hmm. And the, the veterinarians that have done well, a lot of them in practice, have done well because they turned out to be good business people. Mm -hmm. uh, for those people who want to simply do clinical medicine, and not worry about anything. They they accept a set schedule for less money than they, and less responsibility mm -hmm. than if they had their own practice and worked much harder mm -hmm. and had much more responsibility. And I think that I'm generalizing and it's an opinion, but I think that more of the graduates today prefer that scenario for a, mm. a career than the go alone. However, there are a few very large one entity uh, specialty hospitals. The one that immediately comes to mind is in Red Hook, New Jersey. They have more than 60 specialists in that hospital. Mm. Wow. From everything from dermatology to neurosurgery to uh, ophthalmology uh, mm. and on and on and on. And now that is a strictly referral practice. Mm. Uh, I talked to uh, one of my long-term friends yesterday and he told me that his wife, uh, who took over her father's hospital in Pennsylvania, now has four board-certified board surgeons on her staff mm. and she's going in partnership with another veterinarian down the street for a cat machine, a cat scan machine. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea of a university having a cat scan machine is uh, is pretty pretty up there. Uh, folks don't realize it, but the cost, the maintenance contract on a machine like that is 10% of the cost of the machine, uh, regardless of whether they do anything or not. If your machine costs you a million dollars, your maintenance contract is $100,000 per year. Mm -hmm. That's some changes. Well, so, is uh, any, anything in your, you know, that we have not addressed, uh, uh, Dr. Morgan, about uh, the Oklahoma State University College of Veterinary Medicine or about the profession? Or, uh, that we... Well, we've, we've touched on uh, several things, but one major emphasis that's come out in the last few years even though it's been there all along, is uh, the concept of one medicine, one health. Mm -hmm. That the dividing lines between human medicine and animal medicine uh, uh, are pretty thin. Mm -hmm. And again, the idea that a lot of the things used mm -hmm. uh, in human medicine were developed in veterinary medicine. Uh, going back to basics, uh, the syringe was developed by a veterinarian because he couldn't get some of certain animals to take medication by mouth or any other way. Uh, veterinarians were the first ones to discover that uh, diseases could be transmitted uh, by arthropods, uh, Texas cattle fever. Two veterinarians discovered that that was transmitted by ticks and from that Walter Reed, a physician, says if cattle can get things transmitted by ticks, why can't people get things transmitted by mosquitoes? Mm -hmm. And he's the one that discovered that yellow fever mm -hmm. was transmitted by mosquitoes, which enabled the Panama Canal to be built. Yeah. Up until that time, mm -hmm. it, it was a, a wipeout because of yellow fever. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, the, uh, of the... <clears throat> I'm probably off a number or two here. But of the 10 new evolutionary diseases, infectious diseases that evolved in the last decade, 
uh, eight of them have been zoonotic diseases. So if we can't control them in animals, we're not going to be able to control them in people. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones that hit the, the news most recently, of course, is avian influenza. Mm -hmm. uh, the anthrax uh, scare, uh, you're familiar with that mm -hmm. from those that are around. And I might say here that a large number of veterinarians, including uh, our graduates, actually are now working for Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Barrett, whom I mentioned, mm -hmm. even though his title is director of uh, Plum Island facility, uh, he's paid for by Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. And many others that uh, are trained and are training others to be first responders. If it is, if pneumonic plague, for example, mm -hmm. a zoonotic disease is introduced, uh, veterinarians know as much or more about it than, than other people. Uh, the, another group I can think of, there was a guy named Dave Johnson who was with the U.S. Public Health Service. I believe the Institute of Medicine, but I'm not sure. But his job was to develop new surgical techniques, uh, primarily for the military. Mm -hmm. But if somebody says, we've got to find a way to do a better shunt on the gallbladder, mm -hmm. then he and his team would develop that procedure in animals mm -hmm. and then train physicians mm -hmm. who would do it in people. Mm -hmm. So uh, the ever more obvious interplay between veterinarians and human medicine, I'd say is a, if I had to pick up one big evolution in the last 50 years, that's it. Anything else in that cover? No, I'll wait to get the hate mail.